Hi everyone, this is part 4 of our robotic design series. In the previous video, we created a robotic arm that put function above form, meaning that we put more effort into making it functional than making it look cool. Back in video 2 we did the opposite of that, where we spent more time making it look cool than making it functional. The purpose of this was to demonstrate two sides of the coin when it comes to bringing concepts to life, and how the bias for one or the other will change depending on the purpose of what you are creating. In this video, we're going to look at ways to synergize form and function to come up with designs that both look cool and actually have some function to them. Even though we are still using robotics as a point of focus, many things talked about in this video are about general design and modeling theory, so they will still be applicable to different fields. So let's start. One of the things we demonstrated in the second video was implied functionality. The reason why we created details to imply a function even though it didn't exist was to trick the viewer into thinking that the arm was capable of bending even though it would be physically impossible. Taking a look at ways to synergize form and function, one of our main priorities is finding a way to get something that looks cool but is also capable of functional motion, meaning that we won't have to rely on implied functionality to trick the viewer. In this regard, the best approach we can take is one of priorities. When building with a focus on form, we started with surface details and tried to use them to inform the visual direction, only placing implicitly functional structural elements where they might be seen by the viewer. When building with a focus on function, we disregarded details and only created structural elements where they would interact with other structural elements. What we can say about both of these is that we started our work with different priorities in mind. When synergizing form and function, the best thing we can do is start with function and then end with form. That way, any details we want to create for visual effect will be made on top of a functional foundation that we know will be movable. Doing it the other way around would be much more difficult and require destructive changes to the visual style to compromise for functional purposes. I've put together a little chart to show the flow of priorities that would be useful to stick to when trying to get the best of both worlds. But just remember that artwork and design is a creative process and there's no such thing as a perfectly linear path to reaching the result. The general process would be this. We create a foundation that acts as a frame, working from connectable joint and transition pieces, but we know exactly how they move together. After this frame has been created, we can move on to supplement it with details that follow an art style, as well as create divergent variations using the frame as a starting template. A good example to demonstrate this idea would be to look at something like the power armor from Fallout 4. All power armor variations are built from modular pieces that sit on top of a chassis. The chassis is responsible for motion, whereas the armor detail pieces are there for visual effect. In fact, this consideration for under the hood design, as we might call it, can be seen all the way throughout the concept art of Fallout 4, through all of the robotic and synthetic designs. But of course a lot of this served a purpose, which is that the game has damage models for all of these entities, so areas under the surface of the object needed to be modelled for the player to see. And this is not a sponsor or anything, but if you have any interest in picking up the art book for Fallout 4 at some point, I highly recommend it because it's definitely one of my favourites. But taking another look at the workflow, this is where subjectivity and purpose comes into play. The overriding caveat to our idea of synergizing form and function is that the two are not always mutually exclusive, and the balance of either will be shifted depending on the end goal, as well as what creative liberties an artist or designer is allowed or instructed to take. With that in mind, let's look into these in more detail. Under function, the terms are pretty self-explanatory. Connectivity refers to joints and transition refers to pieces that build the frame in between the joints. Imagine that a robotic form is usually just a series of joints that connect to other joints in different ways. For form, I've got four points of thought that are a little more interesting. Firstly, we have complementary. Complementary details are those that accentuate the functionality or foundation in some way. We could say that any stylization applied to joints and transition pieces can be considered complementary details because they accentuate the functionality. Following that, we have additive. Additive details are those that are added on top of or alongside functional pieces that do not necessarily have the purpose of accentuating them. Examples of this would be armor pieces, cloth, random greebles, and so on. Following this, we have art style. The art style is pretty self-explanatory and will differ depending on the context of the design. Then we have divergence, which refers to the potential to create different variations on top of the functional foundation or frame. Looking back at the power armor example, we can point this out. Large segments of the chassis are functional pieces such as joints and the frames that connect to the joints. If we look at these framing pieces, we notice the creative use of empty space and extrusions that don't necessarily serve a purpose, but they look cool and accentuate the functional pieces. Therefore, I would consider them complementary details. 
If we pan over though, these layers of armor that sit on top of the chassis are interchangeable and primarily exist to serve an artistic style. I would consider these additive details. We can also notice that on the chassis there are wires and piping connecting the torso to the lower sections. We don't necessarily know what function they serve, but a function is implied nonetheless, and it does well to contribute to the cool factor. So not everything needs to be categorized. When you're synergizing form and function in ways like this, the lines become blurry, and that's not a bad thing. On the contrary, creativity does well in fuzzy scenarios, rules are meant to be broken and so on. I'm never sitting down and categorizing the objects I make when modeling, but the reason I'm teaching it this way is so that the concepts can serve as a guide in times when you may not know how to tackle a type of multi-layered design. One commonality in this is that I've been putting an emphasis on modeling from the inside out, which is useful for mechanical systems, but again that depends on the requirements of the design and the artist's approach to the task. For things like spaceships, it would be more functionally useful to build the internals and then build a shell around them. But then once you are done, you might not like the way that it looks on the outside. So thinking about it this way, you have two options. You can build the hull around the internals, or you can build the hull to start with and then try to squeeze the internals in there later. It's not all that different to robotics, except in a gameplay environment, a spaceship may be an explorable environment. Whereas I don't think I've played in any game environments as of yet that require exploring the inside of an android. I would say that sometimes for people that are new to modeling, working from the inside out and progressively adding layers is easier because it's more informative and helps you to better visualize an end result. This is where kit bashing can show you the way. It saves you time on modeling individual joints and transitions multiple times and means you can get a frame up and running in a fraction of the time. You will likely then feel a lot more confident about the direction than if you were freeform modeling with no direction to start with. Speaking of kit bashing, if you pick up the resources for this series on my ArtStation store page, you will notice that it comes with a collection of template pieces for informative kit bashing. This includes a few objects under a category I've called hooked curves, which are basically curves with the end handles hooked to hard surface ports on the ends, which you can copy to your projects and then use them to rapidly place things like cabling and wiring. So to round this off, let's take Take a look at some examples of interesting robotic concepts and designs. Over here we have Vitaly Bolgorov, who is very well known as an established hard surface designer. His collection of work is interesting because you can identify a diverse range of approaches. Some of his work is more self-contained, where the number of unnecessary details is limited, whereas other pieces are much more chaotic with a lot of details that are just there to add to the cool factor. The variety demonstrates the range of their understanding. Referring back to our workflow guide, we can see that this robot is multi-layered, with easily identifiable additive details on the surface. Vitaly often makes use of kit bashing to inform their direction. I remember watching their ArtStation masterclass where they made this specific robot. Taking a look at the slough, as it's called, we can see nice attention to function for things like spikes on the end of the claws. It's only a minor detail, but I really like it because it serves a good purpose. He does have a YouTube channel Channel, but he doesn't post to it that often. He does also sell kit bash models amongst other things online, so I'll link his website in the description. Over here we have Paul Pepera. I've shown his work on this channel before when I mentioned that he passed away some time ago. He always had a brilliant knack for creating believable hard surface structures that implied a proper function. I mean, these cutouts are fantastic. There's a lot of finer details, but also a good balance of shaping. In fact, we can see that he had a bit of a thing for robot arms too, definitely taking inspiration from the Canada arm that usually accompanies the now decommissioned space shuttle. So wrapping this whole series up, I hope you've learned something. I've tried to make it so that there's something that people of any skill level can take away with them, which is why there's been a mix of theory and practical modeling. In the first video, we talked about a range of concepts relating to robotic design, such as form versus function, implied functionality, evolutionary inspiration, and more. In videos two and three, we demonstrated the difference of prioritizing form and function separately and how that will change the way we approach things. And in this video, we discussed ways to approach synergizing form and function or looking at a guideline workflow. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from all this, it's that artwork, concepting and design will always be highly subjective. So take everything with a pinch of salt, go out into the digital world and make something your own. Remember, you can pick up all the resources from this series on my ArtStation store page, which includes all of the model and blend files. My social media is listed at the end of the video, so go and follow me if you want to stay up to date on future videos and products. With that being said, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.